So now I'll start with my customary verse in Pali. <laughs> this is a quiz part of the, uh, the talk where I ask, where, where does this come from, if people know? Imaya Dhamma Nudhamma Patipatya Bhudhang Pujemi Imaya Dhamma Nudhamma Patipatya Dhammang Pujemi Imaya Dhamma Nudhamma Patipatya Sangang Pujemi Adai Maya Patipatya Jati Jarabia di Maranamma Parimunchi Sami Sadi Sadi Do people know where that is from? It's a trick question actually. Did the Buddha say this? Oh, I thought some people would know for sure, actually. No, the Buddha definitely didn't say this, but <laughs> it's a later, it's a later garter or verse that uh, people use. And what it means, and this is the theme for the uh, talk, actually, is I honor, because we've done the um, honoring of the Buddha, chanting the recollections of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And so this is uh, very good. And this is what the, uh, this verse says, uh, I honor, or I pay respects to the Buddha, to the Dhamma and the Sangha, by this practice, according to Dhamma, by this practice I will be freed from birth, old age, sickness and death. So the emphasis in this, uh, these uh, verses, which I really like, because when we think of making offerings to the Buddha, we often think of the candles, the incense and flowers, don't we? But really, the, the offering, the real offering to the Buddha, these are fine, they're lovely actually. And for, you know, for traditional Buddhists, myself included, they give rise to a very nice feeling when we do offer these uh, things, when we offer uh, lights, incense and flowers. But the real uh, offering to any teacher, of course, is our practice of what they've taught us. You know, and not only the practice of the course, purpose of the Buddha's teaching is for realization, isn't it? To develop insight, to develop liberation. And this is really how we can honor the Buddha, is by becoming enlightened, but by practicing, sincerely practicing, uh, uh, and using the Buddhist teachings as a guideline for our lives. So the, one of the things that always strikes me with the Buddha's teaching is how practical they are. They're very, uh, very much address to uh, our day-to-day -day lives. And I know one of the, one of the things that uh, uh, we, you often find, and uh, people tell me in Sri Lanka it's quite common, there are a lot of people who like to discuss Dhamma, discuss it, but not necessarily practice it. <laughs> and they're very well versed in it. And this is such a shame because, of course, you know, it's a bit like having a medicine, you know, you might have a medicine for hay fever, like Venerable Susara's got hay fever, maybe even flu, I think it's a bit, bit serious. Um, and having that medicine, keeping it on the shelf and bowing down to it every day and thinking, and think, oh, wonderful, this medicine's wonderful, wonderful, but never taking it, <laughs> never taking it. What good will that be? But, uh, of course, you know, this way we have to take the medicine in order for that to have an effect. And of course the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha is often likened to a physician. Uh, so he, he is a doctor par excellence for our minds, for the unhappiness, the uh, difficulties, the sufferings in our minds. And uh, the medicine, of course, is the Dhamma. And this is uh, um, what we uh, try to practice, put into practice in our daily life. And of course the Sangha, are those that have taken the medicine and have got good results. <laughs> They've got well. <laughs> so there's a chance that we'll get well too. And this reminds me of, because uh, uh, I have to uh, tell an Nazarudin story, of course. It's almost, somebody told me they'll start chanting Nazarudin, Nazarudin, Nazarudin. <laughs> but I'm running out of them. I thought I was just leaving in time. But this is a new one, actually, and one that's new, I haven't told before anyway. One day, uh, Nazarudin was um, preparing a meal in, outside. He had a, the, the kitchen often 
you know, was away from the house because of the smoke and so forth. And he was preparing a meal and it was with liver. It had a piece of liver that he was uh, very, not so good for vegetarians, but <laughs> had a liver that he was going to cook, or his wife was going to cook. And just as he was getting, getting, as he was getting ready to prepare to cook the liver, down flew an eagle and it swooped down and it grabbed the liver and flew off. But Nasrudin wasn't, uh, wasn't put out. He said, you fool, you fool, I still have the recipe. <laughs> 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 Wonderful, isn't it? He's got the recipe, no liver. Because <laughs> what is the recipe? The recipe is the Dhamma. It is, it's a Buddhist teaching. We've got the, the Buddhist teaching, but if we don't have the liver, what's the liver? It's our practice. If we don't have the liver, then we don't have the meal. We don't practice the Dhamma. We don't get the benefits. We don't get filled with the Dhamma, as it were. That's lovely. You fool, you st I still have the recipe. <laughs> it's great. So, as I mentioned, you know, ceremonies are useful. Uh, in, and we had one last week. I have to say they're useful because we had one last week for the, marking the end of the rains retreat. And this is called the, uh, traditionally called Katina, actually, Katina. And ceremonies have their place and they, they have their benefits. And one of the main things, it brings people together. That's very good. And hopefully brings them together in harmony, you know, to work together. You have to work together for these ceremonies. One person can't do it all on their own. So that's very good. And it also, one of the, the major things it can do is bring up faith. This is so, called sadha. And when that brings up faith, then that's a possibility. When we have faith, we usually have energy. And when we have energy, the Buddha said, we can develop uh, mindfulness, sati. And when we have mindfulness, we can develop samadhi, that one-pointedness of mind, mind coming together, getting incredible power. And then from that, from the mind becoming very still, very deep, very powerful, we can develop the wisdom that liberates. And this is all coming from faith. So when we have ceremonies, this is a good opportunity to develop faith, to bring up faith. It can, can bring up a lot. So it is of use. But, um, of course, you know, we, we can ask, what, what is practice? You know, what is practice? What things are part of practice? Anybody got an idea? I talk about it quite a bit, so it's easy. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, meditation is a big part. Any others? I think traditional Buddhists know this very much. Dana, Dana yes. Dana, next one. Sila, the next one. Bhavana, Bhavana, yeah, same. Yes, it's those three areas of uh, Dana, which is giving or sharing, and uh, then uh, Sila, which is eth ethical conduct, it's moral conduct. And of course, bhavana is cultivating the mind. So it includes meditation, but not only meditation. And the important thing I, I emphasize is that because it's a training for the mind, it's a 24-7 practice. It's 24 hours. You know, when we're asleep, of course, we can't practice. Because we have our minds with us 24-7. We make karma 24-7, uh, as it were. So this is a practice that's really aimed at 24-7, uh, you know, doing it whenever we're aware, throughout our day. It's not only for when we're at the temple, and people are very good at the temple. Usually these things, are <laughs> you know, they offer dana and they, they keep sila and um, also d maybe do some bhavana. So the importance of um, these three areas, of course, is we can use them. They're very active thing. So dana, you have to do something. It's giving and sharing. And of course, ethical conduct, you have to do something. You have to restrain from doing some things. You can do other positive things, of course, as well. And with cultivating the mind, this is the action of looking at what state the mind is actually in. So with dana, the idea, and I like the saying, I, I use it when I teach, when I give talks on dana, on giving and sharing. And the Buddha emphasized how important that is for us. But I like the saying from another teacher, I think you'll recognize, give and you shall receive. This, of course, is what Jesus said. But the Buddha could easily have said that too. I mean, he says that with karma. We create karma from giving 
uh, from our actions of body and speech, of course, and it will come back to us in, in uh, we call it vipaka, there will be results, karma vipaka. So we're creating good happiness, we're creating karma, and also when we give, the great benefit of giving is to create happiness in the mind, a positive state in the mind. It doesn't always, <laughs> this is the idea. Because when we give, usually it does have that very positive feel to it. And I always say to people, if they feel depressed, and this is very, very uh, sound advice from anybody, if a person feels depressed, to give is a wonderful way to lift that depression. Because to, you know, have the, it brings up these positive emotions, you feel like you're, you're helping somebody else, you're useful. And this is very important for bringing up a, a, a happy state of mind. And when the mind is in this state, when it's got happiness, when it's got energy, then it's, it's uh, useful for developing what we call samadhi, one-pointedness. So it's very, very useful giving. And it's why the Buddha emphasizes dana, sila and bhavana. You hear it over and over again, especially. Um, so it's very important. And of course, sila, this moral conduct or ethical uh, conduct, is, is a gift to ourselves because it protects us. It protects us from bad karma. It also, very, very obviously, you know, if anybody kills uh, another person, for instance, there'll be bad karma pretty soon after that. Uh, there'll be results pretty soon after that. And also with our speech, we're very aware, you know, if, if we speak harshly to a person, we lie or whatever, there will be results, sometimes instantly. If, if you say something to somebody, there can be instant karma, as we call it. As John Lennon called it, actually, instant karma. So it's very useful for protecting ourselves, but it also gives us a sense of self-esteem and worth. Because you know you're keeping a good standard. And this is a gift not only to ourselves, but to the world. Because this is, this is a foundation of peace. The five precepts which we um, talk just a few minutes ago, is a foundation of peace. If the world kept this, wow, it would be like heaven. It would be amazing. It would be extraordinary. So this is a real, uh, a real gift and an important part of the practice that we, and how we can honour the Buddha by, uh, through our giving, sharing and ethical conduct. And of course the um, mental cultivation, this is called bhavana in Pali, is very important. Because this is where it's all coming from, isn't it? Where is speech and action coming from? From the mind. And so the essence of uh, the mental cultivation, looking after our mind, and this is very much the case, we are really looking after the mind, is to avoid and to let go of negative or uh, unwholesome states of mind, dark states of mind, and to develop and maintain positive states of mind. And this is so important for our happiness. Because if we reduce the negative, increase the positive, we're going to be much happier. And also, as I mentioned, very much, bhavana is a cultivation of the mind. It's a bit like emptying the rubbish bin, you know, emptying all the, all the rubbish, you know, all these negative things that we've accumulated and we think are so important, all the hurts that we've accumulated. Um, and, you know, we hold on to because we think they're ours and they're important. And uh, we have to live with the consequences, which is dark states of mind, heavy states of mind. And I've been encouraging, especially when I gave a talk on forgiveness, to empty the wheelie bin. We empty the wheelie bins every week. We take them out to the verge. If we didn't, it would be terrible. It would be very smelly, unhygienic. We would have lots of problems. But I say, how often do we take the mental wheelie bin out to the verge with all the rubbish from uh, the past hurts, what people have done and said to us? Uh, so this is more important for us, actually, because then we can, it lightens us, brings happiness to the mind, and we don't have to be taken up with these states. They really can obsess the mind. And it's for, our, for as I say, for our happiness and well-being. But as a, the main problem with that, of course, is seeing, first of all, that it is rubbish. <laughs> and you can tell it's rubbish because it really feels bad. <laughs> and it smells bad mentally, you could say, even. And then to realize that, you know, it's, n it's not worth hanging on to because it's not mine, really. It was happened, it's over, it's finished, let go. It's easy said, hard to do. <laughs> I know that myself. So, so this, today I was actually 
going to talk, we'll see if we have time for, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, cultivating the mind. And I'd introduce that by talking about uh, last Friday night, I visited someone who was uh, um, just passing away. They, were, uh, they died later that evening at midnight on Friday. And when I went to visit this woman, her daughter was there. It was lovely, actually. The daughter was staying, had a mattress in the, in the room and was staying there for a number of days with her mother and looking after it. When I came in, there was Buddhist chanting and I thought, oh, gee, that's nice. <laughs> very nice. And it would be very good for the woman who's passing away because she's a Buddhist. And uh, so um, then I gave the precepts, even though this, uh, the mother, the woman who was passing away, she was not, uh, she couldn't speak, her eyes were closed, um, but she did make sounds from time to time, especially when I did chanting. There were sounds, little, mm, mm, you know, and I thought, oh, that's good. So I think she was there, she was there. She could hear, but couldn't really respond, because she was very close to death. And I gave her the, uh, the precepts, like we just, we just uh, took here, and then also uh, we did a little bit of meditation. We did loving-kindness meditation, metta meditation. And I had the image, I like it very much actually. For Buddhists, you can, you can, any, any religion can use it, to have the Buddha and sitting in front of the Buddha and then him radiating his metta, his loving-kindness, his maitri. And that, you know, for a Buddhist, that will be very, very strong, filling you with it, and then you can, you know, radiate it to others. So we did that, and then we did some chanting as well. So it was a very nice visit. And, um, you know, I felt she was very, very peaceful. It's a great, great honour, a privilege, really, to be there when someone is dying. You learn so much. Because it's all the art of letting go. <laughs> when you're getting to that stage, you have to let go. But some people really hang on. And she was good, because she let go a few hours later. So this is, this is why I was going to focus on metta uh, today. Because it's such an important... Uh, uh, meditation. It's more than a meditation, actually. It's it's a, a guide for our actions of our actions of body and speech as well. It uh, can inform our whole life. And when we develop metta, when we develop this uh, loving kindness uh, in Sinhala, it's Maitri, uh, this friendliness. It's a very easy way to avoid or let go of negative states of mind. It's, a, it's a, the shortcut, that's what I call it, the shortcut. In Sinhala, the Ketipara, <laughs> Maitri. So the unwholesome and negative states don't have so much room when we develop wholesome states of mind like metta. But moreover, metta is a very enjoyable, pleasant state of mind. Why not? <laughs> Why not develop that as much as possible? So, and I always like to mention too that, that the Buddha didn't invent metta. He invented the word metta, perhaps, I'm not sure, or the word maitri. He, it was, it's a common emotion that all human beings have, and maybe animals too. It is quite likely they have, you see animals with a lot of, uh, they seem to have this affection and love for their, you know, their offspring, their children and so on. But what the Buddha did, he taught it as a, as a meditation to make it unbounded, he made it, made it incredibly powerful as a vehicle for enlightenment. You can actually use metta for that. Because what it does, of course, when the mind is in this wholesome state, the, the negative um, obstacles to meditation drop, drop out. They, they're reduced or you know, can completely disappear for a time. So, you know, the sort, sorts of negative uh, emotions particularly that uh, Meta is good for is fear, anger, hatred, uh, anxiety, depression, these sorts of negative emotions. But also, you know, those strong sensual desires, things that we, you know, food and thinking about food and um, sights that we've seen, videos and sport that we've watched, <laughs> or any of these sorts of things connected to the five senses, become less interesting when we have meta in the mind because it's so pleasant, as does drowsiness and sleepiness. The mind is energized when it has metta. And also restlessness and worry, they go down. These are the classic five hindrances, all these, these ones, and doubt too. Because we have this real softness in the mind, this real warmth in the mind. 
So it's, it's a, a nice, I liken uh, metta, maitri, to medicine. And it's a medicine for all these negative aspects of the mind. It can help uh, reduce the sickness that we experience from those. So I'd like to also uh, mention what is metta is, is very important. I think most people, any, any people got any ideas? What is metta? Loving kindness, that's good. The most important thing, it's a feeling. That's, that's a feeling. That's for me is sometimes uh, if we don't get the feeling when we develop uh, uh, meta meditation, when we're doing it, for instance, then we haven't really you know, started, started practicing it. But meta, of course, is a feeling of well-wishing for ourselves and for others, friendliness, acceptance, goodwill, um, appreciation, ease. We, we chanted that, didn't we? In the, interestingly enough, in the meta chant in Western Australia, we, we chant, may, may, uh, may you be happy. We don't say at ease. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, so it has happiness as well. Safety, security, openness, all these sorts of things. So it's very, very useful. So metta is something that uh, we, uh, the basis for metta, it's very important, it's interesting with metta. If we don't have an understanding of metta, to practice metta you need quite a bit of wisdom actually to make it really work. And the basis for metta for me and I think for all practitioners is that everyone, myself included, wants happiness. Everyone wants friendship, they want, want safety, they want peace. And they want to avoid the problems, you know, the negativity, the anger, the irritation, uh, the, the uh, sicknesses of the body, these things. This is what everybody wants. So metta, or maitri, loving kindness, is wishing these things for everyone, just as I would wish them. What I know would be, what I feel would be good for me, I feel would be good for others. We're not far uh, wide of the mark if we do that. And so we look at the good qualities of ourselves and others. This is important because oftentimes, who do we live mostly with? Who are we closest to in our lives? Ourselves, exactly. <laughs> so looking for the good qualities is important because we have the more like the fault-finding mind that sees the, the shortcomings, what, how I could be improved and all these sorts of things. And I remember a friend telling me the other day on the telephone, he said, he has, I think he said, over a shelf full of self-improvement books. <laughs> I asked him, have you read them? <laughs> he said, some of them I've looked at a little bit. But, you know, it's that emphasis on we've got to improve myself, you know, and we have quite a, a, a negative take on it. It's not to say that self-improvement books aren't good because we can get some good tips, can't we? And this is very important for it. But it does show that we can have that negative viewpoint of ourselves particularly. Because you know what uh, that's English saying? Familiarity breeds? Yeah, exactly, breeds contempt. So when we're so close to ourselves, we can be really hard on ourselves and, uh, and not see the good qualities in ourselves. So we're looking at what's right in ourselves and others, and this is very, very useful. Particularly the environments where it's uh, very important is in the family, at work, at school. These places are where they are, uh, they are where these uh, looking for what's good and right about people is very useful because it can reduce that sort of negativity, <laughs> some of the, the bad karma from speech and action that might occur otherwise. Of course, meta is unconditional. Uh, we just chanted that it's uh, like, uh, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So it's, a, it's an unconditional love that doesn't put, you know, doesn't, well, it doesn't put conditions on it, you know. Uh, sometimes we do, most of the love that we give others, there are conditions, especially romantic love, the person's got to love me back. Don't, don't they? That's one of the conditions. If they don't, and if they, if they get interested in anybody else, wow, that's 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 big time, uh, you know, uh, breaking the conditions. But met is unconditional, and of course we have Ajahn Brahm's story. You, you all know the opening the door of your heart. His father actually, when he was a young man, a teenager, 
I think his father must have been very brave, actually. <laughs> he said, the door of my home is always open to you, no matter what you do. You're welcome. And Ajahn Brahm, of course, has seen this as the door of my heart's always open to you. I don't know how many parents could say that, you know, regardless of you know, what their children get up to. But especially if we have that attitude of uh, unconditional giving like that, people tend to live up to it, actually, don't they? So I'm sure, sure Ajahn Brahm was, uh, as a teenager, you know, responded to that really well. But it's very nice if, if our parents can say that. It's not easy, especially some of the things that can happen with children getting into drugs or other things that can come up. And as I mentioned, it's very different from the uh, romantic love that is, has a lot of conditions. It's very different from even from family love because there's a lot of expectation, isn't there, from parents, even though in the Metta Sutta this is the ideal. But we all know, you know, that... Uh, uh, and parent, parents will know this very much. There's a lot of attachment to our, to children. And I know some people will tell me, you know, they are very afraid that their children, you know, they might, you know, they might die. Well, they will die someday. But something could happen to their children. Is a, is, can be a major fear, major anxiety. And I've heard a few mothers tell me this particularly. So meta is something that uh, um, when we meet it, when we meet people with metta, it's quite a, um, it's, it's a very warm feeling and a, and a very uh, pleasant. You feel connected with the person who's got metta, a lot of metta. And I know one person who had, has a lot of metta, Ajahn Ganha. Have you heard of him? He's a Thai monk. Yeah, he's very famous in Thailand. And uh, he's very big. And he, he came and stayed at the monastery in uh, Serpentine. And uh, the... Uh, he was there for, I think, over a year, actually. He came twice, I think, one uh, a year each time, something like that. And one time the Shire were coming to look at, uh, to talk to the uh, abbot, who wasn't Advan Brahm at that time, about building permission for some new huts and so on. So it was a bit, a bit tense. <laughs> and uh, they were concerned, you know, because he could say no. And, uh, and so they were... And, the, um, the president of the council came, came into the monastery and this monk, Ajahn Ganha, who doesn't speak much English, he met him and he smiled and I, I think exuded a lot of loving kindness. And then he rubbed his tummy. <laughs> and even the Ajahn Brahm and his predecessor, Ajahn Jagger, were like, oh, goodness, what's going, what has he done? <laughs> there goes our huts, <laughs> for sure. But he didn't at all, he really liked it. He really liked it. And in fact, that was, uh, you know, sort of broke the ice, you might say. But I don't know if it's recommended, though, to break the ice that way. It may work. I think anything will work as long as you've got metta. You know, if you've got that maitri, that loving kindness, it will work. But imagine, <laughs> incredible. So this is the, uh, the important thing with the, when we meet people with metta, when we develop metta ourselves, we like it. And we have a sense of trust and connection with the person. It's a warmth. Uh, that goes with it. And also, metta doesn't, this is an interesting side, uh, I came and used to teach this very much, that metta is an impersonal kind of love. Doesn't it sound odd, impersonal? But it doesn't come from the sense of, you know, it's an impersonal quality in the sense, the quality of the mind or the heart. And it only depends on developing the conditions for it. Often we can say, oh, I'm not good at metta, I don't have much metta, or men say, I often hear this from men, oh, metta meditation's a bit difficult. <laughs> I find it hard to connect with it. But really it doesn't. It's a quality of mind that everyone has and we can develop it given the right causes and conditions. So that's, that's the uh, good news, I think, good news for us. I know for me it was very, uh, very useful because once I thought of it like that, it wasn't a matter of my ability to develop metta. It was just a quality that I was building in the mind. And we can all do it. And of course, as I mentioned, metta is for reconditioning the mind. Because I mentioned we, we need to develop metta in daily life, 24-7 is good. You know, daily life for sure, when we're speaking and acting, they're very important places to use metta, use loving kindness. But where we can really condition or recondition the mind is through the meditation. We can develop more 
uh, incline the mind more towards metta so that when we go into daily life, we can take it with us. And this is the idea, to recondition the mind, to bring that um, uh, loving kindness, friendliness, uh, openness into acceptance, into daily life. And it makes a very big difference. And of course, it's a a very um, pleasant experience to do that. And uh, one of the teachings I like very much, uh, or probably soon I have to do the guided meditation, I think, do a little guided meditation, because this is about practice today. So. <laughs> but uh, one of the sayings I like, um, uh, it comes from the fact, first of all, if we have metta in the mind, if we develop metta in our hearts and our minds, we have this, we're filled with loving kindness. We're filled with this positive emotion, friendliness, warmth, acceptance, openness. And this is often what we're looking for in relationships, isn't it? It's what we're actually seeking for in relationships, looking for Mr. Right, Miss Right, by you know, looking for this love from the other person. But if we have love, we have got what we want, actually, and therefore we're less needy in terms of relationships. We can bring that to the relationship rather than trying to get, get it from the other person. They may not may not be capable of it at that time. But one of the sayings that brings this home very much is that, and I think it's lovely, it's from Gaur Gopal Das. Many people know him. He's a, he's a Hare Krishna monk who uh, is, teaches a lot on the internet. He's very good, I think. And he said this one time, he said, if, if we want to be loved, we may not be loved. But if we want to give love, who can stop us? And it's so true. Not only they can't stop us, but we are filled with the love. So this is, uh, this is this very important point, actually, of about developing metta. And I remember my first, uh, first time I taught, actually, outside the monastery. Uh, this was probably when I was a monk for about four reigns, five, five years, four or five years. And I went to the local meditation group. This is our training ground. Those poor people, <laughs> they have to put up with all the, all the training, you know, all the junior monks coming and uh, you know, learning their skills in teaching and so on. And they're very good, actually. It's very nice. It's a nice meditation group. And I went to this, uh, this group. Uh, it's in the evening, on a Tuesday evening. And before that, we have a cup of tea. We have a cup of tea in the afternoon, about 6 o'clock. And I saw Ajahn Brahm there, and I had my cup of tea and left early because I had to uh, get there by seven. And he, you know, he said, wish me well and so forth. And I started this meditation this evening talking about what I was going to talk about, which, which wasn't metta. It wasn't metta meditation, loving kindness meditation at all. <laughs> and as I was talking about it, I had these waves of metta, loving kindness going through me. I call it 240 volt. Meta. It was really incredible. I thought, good grief, where's this coming from? <laughs> and of course, who did I think of? Who would you think of? I thought of Anjan Brahm, actually. I thought. But I did realize much, much later, only in recent years, there was a woman at the group, Pauline, who was also a meta expert. She's very good at meta as well. It's her main thing. So I thought, oh, maybe it was Pauline. <laughs> But it definitely didn't feel like it was coming from me, you know, because I wasn't talking about it. It was great. It was a very good uh, way to give your first teaching, actually. It was really good. So we can develop, uh, just, yes, I think we start in a minute. We can develop metta uh, traditionally or conventionally. We use words of metta. Um, that's fine if people like to use words of meta. Sometimes we can use images. I Kemmer was very creative, so she had images like one, uh, uh, one could be sun in the heart, radiating uh, meta mitri to ourselves, filling ourselves and then to others. She had flower garden in the heart. We have a flower garden with all these beautiful flowers and they smell nice, look nice, and then you pick them and give them to yourself, to others. It's very nice. And then concepts, and we will use a concept today, like uh, fr best friend as a concept. Um, giving a gift, is it like a concept? You can visualize it too as well. Uh, you can use many different concepts, you know, like gratefulness, 
um, thankfulness, uh, contentment, many things you can use uh, to bring up this feeling of metta. And this is a whole point, to develop that feeling of metta. So uh, today we'll try the um, giving a gift of friendship. And this is sort of like uh, we, can, we think of the qualities of a friend. And we have a, I think you can even do it visually. You can think of a box and put all those good qualities in it and then give it to yourself and then to others. This is the idea. And uh, the idea of giving a gift is very close to metta. It can be. It doesn't always have to be, but it can be. And once when Ajahn Ganha, this monk I mentioned before, he features heavily in this, <laughs> this talk for some reason, uh, he, he was asked how he develops metta. And metta, loving kindness, friendliness. He says, when he wakes up every morning... He thinks, what can I give to the people that I live with in the monastery and then to the whole world? Thinking of giving. And this is what I say about the power of giving. Most of us, when we wake up, what are we thinking about? What I have to do today? What I have to get today? You know, and it's the list you know, it's quite, can be quite long, actually. But if you start the day with, what can I give today? Wow, it's a completely different way to start the day. So this is the, uh, the idea behind this meditation. And uh, maybe uh, one more story is the, I think most people know the um, Nalagiri story. Do you know about Nalagiri? Some will, I think. Nalagiri was an elephant at the time of the Buddha and he was uh, in the, uh, the king's uh, stables. The uh, king was King Ajatasattu. He, uh, he had a, a, an elephant stable, and they had a number of elephants. And there was a plot to kill the Buddha. And uh, amazing, isn't it? Somebody liked the Buddha. Anyway, his, uh, one of the uh, monks, Venerable Dabhidatta, he conceived this desire to take over the Sangha. And the Buddha didn't agree to it. <laughs> and so then he tried to kill him in a number of ways. And this was one of the strategies. He was a friend of the king. Who, had he, who he had impressed with his psychic powers. Like he could appear as uh, a Brahmin, a young boy. He appeared before the king as a young boy. He used all these psychic powers that he had developed through meditation. And so the king was willing to help kill the Buddha. And so uh, what they planned was to get this elephant drunk, give it a lot of alcohol, beat it, <laughs> beat it so it was really uh, angry, raging. Anybody seen these videos of angry elephants? Whoa, it's impressive. They really just lose it. They're really just out of control. And uh, then to open the gates when the Buddha and the other monks were coming for the arms round, every day going for food, going to the village to collect food. And then the idea was the elephant would stampede out and crush him and kill the Buddha. And uh, so they, they did that, they opened the gate, and then when Ananda, the Buddha's personal attendant, stood in front of him, the Buddha said, Ananda, this is, please, this is not necessary. And then the elephant starts charging the Buddha, and he starts radiating, they say, loving kindness, metta. And the elephant slows down, slows down, and stops. And in the story, he even bows down, which is pretty good. And the Buddha touches him, you know, pats him. So this gives an idea of, you know, if an animal can be affected by loving kindness, how much more so people. But it also, where uh, Ajahn Brahm, he, he, he does a nice thing. He said, sometimes our mind is like Nalagiri. It's drunk, it's angry, it's out of control. <laughs> and he said, then, then we need to use metta, Maitri, for that mind state, you know, that we're experiencing then that mind state can slow down and perhaps uh, disappear. So this is, uh, of course, metta is not a, a um, it's unconditional, so we can't say, well, I'll give you metta if you disappear. That's, that's a business deal, that's, that's not unconditional. We give metta to the mind state and it may go, it may not. So I think now we can uh, do a little bit of, uh, do. A, there's a lot, lot more one can say about it. But just do a few minutes, it won't be terribly long, this uh, metta meditation. So if you can just find a comfortable position. 
and to move the body to make it comfortable. Close the eyes, we can close our eyes, and get in touch with the body. And we can bring to mind the intention to give a gift of a friendship, kindness, acceptance to ourselves and to others. And we can bring to mind the qualities of a friend, a best friend. What does that mean for each of us? And to get in touch with those qualities. Maybe it's friendship, friendliness, warmth, kindness, being generous, being open, being connected, feeling a connection, whatever it is. And we can see these qualities and we can put them in a box and wrap that box like a gift. And we give this gift to ourselves, filling ourselves with these very qualities, kindness, warmth, connection, friendliness. And particularly we give it to our bodies, starting from the head and going through the body, just relaxing it, just giving it this matter, this gift of friendship, attention, like a mental massage. giving it the medicine of metta, of maitri, loving kindness. And now we can become aware of the breath coming in and going out. And we can breathe in metta, breathe in loving kindness, friendliness, and breathe out metta, loving kindness, friendliness to the world. Breathing in metta, this warm feeling, and breathing it out to the world. giving this gift to the world and to ourselves of metta.
And now we can bring to mind everyone here in this hall and around this area, radiating this friend, the feeling of friendliness, giving this gift of friendship, of safety, freedom from fear, freedom from worry, to all beings here and in the surrounding area. And we can radiate this feeling of loving kindness, friendliness to all beings everywhere, all over the world and in all realms of existence. Filling them with this, giving them this gift of kindness, care, friendliness. And now we're coming close to the end of the meditation, so we can ask ourselves how we feel now. Do we feel more friendly, more kind, more safe and relaxed, or not? And whatever feelings we had, what caused them to arise? What brought them up? We can share the energy of this meditation with everyone here, with our family and friends, and with all beings everywhere. That they may have more friendliness, loving kindness in their minds, in their hearts. May they be free of difficulties negativity, problems of body and mind. And we can keep in mind the aspiration, may I develop more and more of this loving kindness, this friendliness in my day to day life. To use it wherever I can, whenever I remember and mindful in my speech and in my actions. And we can anchor this feeling of metta, maitri, loving kindness, friendliness, in the heart, this gift in the heart, so that any time, day or night, we can remember that feeling and get in touch with it, bring it up again develop it, cultivate it, make much of it. And now we can slowly come out of the meditation, opening the eyes and moving the body to make ourselves more comfortable. Just to finish off, it's getting late, just to uh, emphasize when we can develop uh, metta meditation, as I said, 24-7, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty much all the time, but before every meditation is very good, because that removes the difficulties and negativities, the hindrances to meditation. Just if, I can, I always used to teach this, you know, just even if it's five minutes or a few minutes, not even five minutes, it's good. And you can use it with the object, like we did with the breath, you can, if you combine a very pleasant feeling with the breath, the mind will stay with it. It's attractive, it's interesting. And this is, of course, uh, um, something that Ajahn Brahm developed. And, of course, to keep metta in mind during the day, 
And you notice that, uh, where's that verse, that line in there? It says, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. If we can sustain this memory, this feeling of metta throughout the day, we can bring it up and use it, particularly in difficult situations. It can be very, very useful. And uh, one last story that, again, Ajahn Gandha, one of my own personal stories. I remember when I first got interested in Buddhism and used to go to the Buddhist Society of Western Australia in its first home, which was in Magnolia Street in North Perth, a small house. And, uh, who, and I, I wasn't used to monks or anything like that. I'd seen Ajahn Brahm and uh, Ajahn Jagra. But I was, I was in the back garden of this place, probably went to the toilet, I think, and then I saw, I was coming back, and I saw this Thai monk coming towards me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what do I do? I was all at sea, you say. All at sea. And I thought, oh, 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 I don't know what I should do. And you know what he did? It was amazing. This was Ajahn Ganha. He came up, and he shook hands. This is incredible, because monks don't do it. In any traditional Buddhist country, they don't do it at all. Thai monks, Sri Lankan monks, it's very uncommon. It was only later, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but later I thought, wow. That's loving kindness for you. It's like rubbing the tummy, isn't it? <laughs> they shook hands with me. I didn't have a big enough tummy. <laughs> so that was lovely. And of course, that made a big difference. Felt much more relaxed. And, you know, because you could obviously see that I was, uh, you know, didn't know what to do in that situation. So I think, uh, um, and then maybe just, uh, yes. Yes, that's so in the end, it's up to us what we develop in our minds, you know. And most people don't realise that actually, which is a real shame, because they see people who are developing a lot of anger, hatred, rage, you know, they may be over political issues, maybe over road rage, all these sorts of things. They practice it a lot. They really get wound up, they get angry, and they're developing more negative qualities. Same with depression. Depression often is based on a negative thought that becomes, we repeat to ourselves like a mantra and it becomes deeper and deeper. And then we can't think of them, we can't recognize the thought almost, just go straight to the feeling. But all these things, you know, we can practice whatever we wish in the mind. We can develop these negative qualities if we wish. We get the consequences. Or we can develop positive qualities and get the consequences of them, which is usually happiness, a sense of fulfillment, connection, uh, and, and a pleasant feeling and also understanding and wisdom can come with it as well usually compassion comes with it too actually, you know, so it's very nice so it's up to us what we develop in the mind and I think it's a shame that people don't realise they have that option they think the mind is just what it is you know, you are like you are and the Buddha is saying, no these, what we are it's just conditioned phenomena, process. Conditioned, all the habits we've developed from the past, all the input from you know, family, friends, the media, you name it. It's all feeding in, making us who we are at the moment. Who we are the, uh, tomorrow, next week, be different. <laughs> it's changing all the time. So why not recondition? Why not and, and, you know, create more positive, enjoyable, pleasant states of mind? Why not develop loving kindness? This is an option, you know, it's, uh, it's something we can all do. So I encourage everyone to develop it as much as possible and enjoy the benefits of that. So thank you very much for listening this morning and to all those on the internet. So if there's any uh, comments or questions or complaints, Neuroplasticity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. The science of neuroplasticity says that we can change our minds. Oh, that's positive. Right. So yes, there's strong scientific backup in what you were saying. Mm, thank you for that. That's good to hear, actually. Yes, because I think many people just feel they're a victim of whatever emotional or mental state they have. That's just there, and you know, you can you can distract yourself or you can take something <laughs> if it's a negative one, a tranquilizer or whatever. So. Yes. Um, just one little comment. Yes, thank thanks, you, Paula. Arjan, for a, a very good talk. But um, a true depressive illness is beyond the control of the yeah. person who is suffering. Yeah. Um, and it really is a body-mind state which needs some 
medical mm. attention. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you, yes. No, I think that can be very much the case, that once uh, one's got heavily into depression, it's... Uh, it's uh, but just a little thing about mm. empathy. Yes, empathy. Because yeah. is that sort of a precursor to loving kindness? Because if you can be in that other person's shoes, yes. you could appreciate where they're, what they're feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a precursor to compassion too, isn't it? You know, if we can put ourselves in other people's shoes, you know, and and to, as I said, you know, if we see that other people will probably. Uh, like the things that we like in terms of, you know, acceptance, warmth, uh, loving kindness, then we're more likely to give it to other people as well, knowing that this is exactly what they're looking for as well. We're all looking for pretty much the same things. So, yeah, empathy is very important, yeah, very important. Because you sometimes see that, sometimes people can't put themselves in other people's place, and that is very, you know, makes for a difficult relationship then. So it's always good if we can do that. Thank you for that comment. Mm. Metta Sutta. yes, yes, Dr. Jai. Ah, there we are. You did mention this Metta should not have a personality involved person. Uh, the, in Metta Sutta, you do not separate one being from another. Correct, yes. If you practice that way, mm. you don't separate yourself from another. That's the idea. That's yes. the idea. Yes. So then there is no self. That's the impersonality. Yes, yes. We break down the barriers, you know, that we have between us and others, you know. Uh, so this is very. This is part of developing the the metta, the, the loving kindness, for sure. Yes, yes, indeed. So thank you for that. That's good. And uh, uh, so it's very. As I mentioned, I don't know if there are any internet questions. No, no questions. All right, we can, we can finish off in a minute. Just to, to make a remit, remind, uh, just to return to the point that I started at, which is this is part of our practice, and this is how we actually pay honour or respect to the Buddha. It's through our practice, and this is one aspect of practice, Maitri, Metta Bhavana, uh, and important that we, you know, do use, uh, do develop our practice, not only of uh, meditation, but of dana, Keeping, giving and sharing, and also sila, which is ethical conduct, the way we speak to others, the way we act with, towards others, and then, of course, developing the mind as we are with Maitri. And I'd like to uh, encourage the Buddhist Society of Victoria to record more of the, uh, the meditations, just the sound, the audio, so that people can actually listen to guided meditations more, because... I feel that half of my teaching here <laughs> is not on the Sunday. That's why I'm doing more meditation on the Sunday now, trying to bring it into the talk, because this is an important part. Because if we go to meditation, is going to the control panel, I say, to the mind. And uh, if we can do that, we can really influence the, 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 uh, the way we experience the world. The way the world looks to us is very much coming from our mind. There is a real world out there, for sure. <laughs> But the way we look at it can be very different <laughs> depending on the conditioning we, we have in place at that time. So thank you very much for uh, listening and I hope some of that has benefit. I hope you can practice some of it or get something useful out of it and, and take it home. <laughs>